Good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we come together for our Monday morning devotional. And as we do so, we return back to the Gospel of Mark. And today we're going to be in chapter 3, looking at verses 20 through 27. And as we come to God's Word, let us begin with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for another week in which to serve you. A week in which we can look forward to both trials and blessings. And dear God, we know that you will guide us through both of them. And dear God, we ask that uh, you would continue to be with your people. Watch over them. Protect them from their own uh, demons, from their own inward trials. That they might again put to death the old man and live in the blessings of the new life granted unto us by Jesus Christ. And to God, we pray that we would all seek your wisdom in your word and that we would not walk as the Gentiles walk, uh, but would look to your wisdom and your truth for all that we do. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we turn to Mark chapter 3 and we're going to be reading verses 20 through 27. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. For they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. So he called them to himself, and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he will plunder his house. Amen. Here we have, once again, the Pharisees trying to destroy the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only do we have the Pharisees doing what they normally do, we also see a multitude of people following the Lord Jesus Christ. And even more so, we see some of his own people going out to lay hold of him, thinking he was out of his mind. Now, Let's talk a little bit about all three of these groups. And let's deal with them as they're presented to us here in this portion of Mark's gospel. First, we have the crowds that are following him. Why are the crowds following Jesus? Some, most assuredly, like the disciples, are following Jesus, as Peter says in John 6, because he has the words of eternal life. They want to be near their Savior. Another group, is uh, these uh, friends of his who are seeking to lay hold of him. Notice what it says there in verse 21. It says they are his own people. Well, next week we're going to look at uh, verses 31 to 35, which tell us who are these people. They are his brothers and his mother. And notice what his brothers and his mother say about him, that he is out of his mind. Now, that's not usually how you know, Mary and the brothers of Jesus are presented, but that's definitely where they are right now in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. They do not fully comprehend what he is on about. And this isn't the only time that Mary isn't quite grasping what's going on. We see a similar thing at the wedding at Cana, where she asked Jesus to help out with the making of wine. And Jesus, you know, being faithful to the fifth commandment, obeys his mother. But remember, Jesus says to his mother that you know, his time has not yet come, that his full flowering is not quite ready to be laid out. And then the third group we have here are the Pharisees, which call him out and say that he has Beelzebub. In other words, that he is uh, indwelt by Satan. Now, first of all, this is a very obvious blasphemous statement. 
to say that Jesus, the Son of the living God, has a demon. And Jesus deals with this accusation in the way that it should be dealt with, by using a parable which illustrates the uh, the, the uh, lack of logic to what the scribes are saying. And this is something that Jesus does quite often with the accusations of the scribes and the Pharisees. He deals with them and shows them the, the, the error of their ways. Now, sometimes he does it in a mocking fashion. Sometimes he does it through straight rebuke. And in other times he uses parables because remember, sometimes Jesus uses parables to hide the truth from those who he does not want to hear it. And this is a case where Jesus is using a parable, again, to show just how foolish the scribes and the Pharisees are to make such an accusation. Because you see, the only one who has the power to cast out demons is God himself. Because again, God is the one who has power over the demons, and over Satan. And we know this, of course, from the book of Job. God sends Satan to Job. Now, some may have trouble with that idea, but again, we see the purpose and the glory of God that comes out of God sending Satan to deal with Job. We see that both Job and the Lord are justified in that. So we know that God is the one in control of these wicked uh, creatures. Now, Jesus tells the scribes and the Pharisees, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Again, why would Satan cast out his own people? Would that not be against his entire purpose? Right? Satan is a deceiver. Satan is one who leads people astray. So it wouldn't make any sense for Satan to want to stop that work from going on. And of course, the scribes should have known this. And why is it again that they choose this particular statement to apply to Jesus? Well, again, they know who he is. And this becomes more apparent the more the scribes and the Pharisees have interactions with Jesus. Eventually, towards the end of the gospel, we have the chief high priest openly admitting that Jesus is the Messiah, but he does not want to hear it. And why is that? Because he does not want to lose his kingdom. He knows that by recognizing Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, means that he would no longer be the high priest, that he would no longer have his power and his riches. And this is often why people do not accept Jesus as the Christ, because they do not want to give up their sin. They love their sin more than they love Jesus. They love their wickedness more than they love to walk in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And this must be something on the mind even of the believer. There are many times in our lives where we have to make very difficult choices about which way we're going to go. And yesterday in the sermon, we talked about the uh, paths of the Gentiles. And Paul implores the people at Ephesus not to walk in the way of wickedness because he describes that way as futility. Futility is a word which means that it has no end. It has no purpose. There is nothing there. You know, I, I use the illustration of teaching me calculus, right? That's a futile work. It's not something I'd be able to do. But the reality is, is that when Jesus calls us to repentance and Jesus calls us to turn away from walking in the ways of the world, we have to make a decision. Do we love Jesus or do we love ourselves? Do we love Christ or do we love the world? And unfortunately, far too many of our younger people, I'm 40 now, I can say that, our younger people are choosing to walk with the world. They are not choosing the paths of Christ because choosing the paths of Christ 
is becoming more and more difficult, and there are real consequences that come from that. Not only are they mocked and derided by friends, even in some cases by family, but it makes it harder to just do daily life. We see this especially in the relationships that you know, folks are entertaining. And again, the call that Christ is making here to the scribes and to anybody who is listening is ask this question. What kingdom do you want to be a part of? Do you want to be the kingdom that is falling away, that is leading to destruction, that has no future? Or do you want to be part of the kingdom that is the future? That the foundation upon which is built in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this has to be the real question. Because we can have all the riches, we can have all the you know, you know, high degrees, we can have you know, fancy letters after our name, we can have all of these worldly blessings. But if we don't have Christ, then they're meaningless. They serve no purpose. And that's again one of the things that Jesus does in this particular parable. Is again, notice what he says here in verse 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Now, it seems somewhat a little strange for Jesus to talk about you know, stealing from a strong man. But notice his point there. His point is that he has come and bound Satan. He has come and won the victory over the devil. And so it's doubly foolhardy for those of us who live on this side of the cross to serve Satan. Because Satan's bound. He has no power. He has no ability. He has no uh, you, you, uh, power outside of what Christ gives him. And so if we go with the devil, we've already chosen the losing hand. And so an encouragement this morning especially as you face decisions this week to turn to the left or to the right, stay on that narrow path. Look back at the old paths and the ways that have been walked by faithful men and women for centuries, for millennia, and understand it is far greater to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And this should be something that we desire. Let that be so for us. And let us remember that we do these things by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us seek our strength and our power from the fountain that never ceaseth. And let us be strong in him. Because our Savior has bound the strong man. And he's already won the victory over death. Take care this week. Be blessed in Christ. And remember the goodness of his way of life. Have a blessed day.